Well, good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Elliot. I'm the associate minister here at The Cove. I want to take a second and welcome you wherever you're joining us from, whether that's on the live stream, on YouTube, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're in the room with us right now, or whether you're listening on the podcast later on in the week. We love you and we're excited that you've decided to spend a few minutes with us this morning unpacking what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about you, but our family has definitely cut down on the driving these days. Someone said we're getting two weeks to the gallon right now. Eh, I'm not sure if that's exactly true, but our gas bill has been cut in half, which has been really nice. Abby and I have been trying to give each other breaks and go on drives, so, but a couple of times I've taken Micah with me, and we play this game called Micah Drives. Now, before you run me out of here for letting my seven-year-old drive, all that means is he gets to choose which way we turn whenever we come to an intersection. We found some pretty interesting places around our neighborhood, that's for sure. We'll cruise around for 20 or 30 minutes, but there comes a point when the game has to end. At that point, it goes back to daddy drives. Why? Because Micah doesn't know how to get home. And as much fun as it is to turn aimlessly and make it up as we go, that isn't going to help us get back to our house. So I've got to direct us because I know the way. Micah's usually disappointed when he isn't allowed to make the decisions anymore. But at the end of the day, neither of us wants to sleep in the car. So daddy takes over. Now, this is what life is like, isn't it? We like the freedom to choose whatever path we want to take. We want the wheel. We want control. We want to decide which direction to go. It's my life. It's my choice. I'm an adult. I can do what I want. It's so far ingrained in our society that we push back against anyone or anything that wants to put restrictions on our lives. We're living in the middle of it right now with this virus. When's the next phase going to go into effect? Why can't I just do what I want? You're infringing on my rights and my liberties. You've heard it, haven't you? Maybe you said it yourself. The interesting thing is, we have the freedom to choose the path we want to take with our lives. God has given us free will, and with it, the ability to choose our own adventure. Anybody remember those books? I loved those books as a kid. Sure, I mean, you'd die most of the time, but man, what a, what a fun ride that was. God gave us free will because without it, we wouldn't have the ability to love. You see, in order to have love, you have to have the choice to love because if you don't have the choice to love, then what you have isn't really love. And God wants us to love him, so he gave us free will. We get to choose our own road, but the truth of the matter is not all roads lead to the same destination. Just like not every road will take Micah and I back to the house, not every choice brings you closer to God. In fact, there's only one road that takes us where we want to go. We have choices, but those choices matter because they have consequences. The hard reality that we're going to have to face as followers of Jesus is that we are just that, followers. That means we're going to have to learn to give up some of the control we hold so dear. That means we're going to have to relinquish control of the decision-making and trust him to take us where we ultimately want to end up. You know, Jesus actually talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. In verses 13 and 14, he's talking about entering the kingdom. And here is what he said. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Jesus is, in fact, telling you what to do here. This is a command. Enter through the narrow gate. He gives us good reason to do so as well. The gate and the road beyond lead to life. So if you believe Jesus knows what he's talking about, you would do well to listen to his direction. So what is the gate that Jesus is talking about? It's actually not the only time he talks about a gate. Check out what he had to say in John 10, verse 9. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. 
And this is an unfamiliar language for Jesus. He claims to be the way to the Father. Just a couple of chapters later in John 14, 6, we hear Jesus say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now you enter through the gate, which is Jesus, into the kingdom. You do so by becoming a Christian. You hear and believe the message of Jesus. Repent of the sin in your life. Confess Jesus as Lord. Get baptized and begin living your life for Jesus. And it's this last part that had me thinking as I was preparing to talk with you. Because we often place so much emphasis on the early parts of the salvation process. We get people baptized and we high five each other and we go on our way. But pay attention to that last part of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. He said, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. It seems to me that the gate is the starting point of this journey. The gate is Jesus and the road is the Christian life. See, you enter through the narrow gate by becoming a Christian. You therefore enter the kingdom, but you're not done. To enter the promise, which is eternal life with God, you have to stay on the path. As the scripture says, he who endures until the end will be saved. When we become a Christian, we receive the Holy Spirit. We learn this in Acts 2.38 because that tells us that, that when we're baptized, we're baptized for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to jump over with me to Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Watch this. It says, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit is a deposit, a promise of our inheritance, which we don't have yet. Eternal life with God is not my reality at this moment in time. It's promised to me as a follower of Jesus and a member of the kingdom, but I've still got a path to walk to enter the promise of God. As it turns out, Jesus is the gate and the Holy Spirit is the guide along the road to life. Along with this command to enter the narrow gate is the promise that the narrow road leads to life. If you want to enter the promise, you've got to follow the path. And this isn't the only time this is the case in the Bible. You see, one of my favorite things about God is that he uses history to illustrate the future. You know, it's the kind of thing you can do when you're the Almighty. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, they had been slaves for 430 years. Their ancestors had come to Egypt to escape the famine, and they had come from the land of Canaan. Ironically, they were going back to Canaan because it was the promised land, after all, that God had promised to Abraham long before the people even entered Egypt. The trip from Egypt to Canaan really wasn't that long. We know this because during the time of the famine back in Genesis, Joseph's brothers made this trip multiple times. And most scholars say that this trip would have taken 10 to 11 days. Yet if you know the story, you know it took Israel much longer than that to reach the promise. Now, admittedly, most of that is because of a poor choice they made when they got to the border of the promised land the first time. But that poor choice notwithstanding, did you know they took the long way to the promised land from the very beginning? Exodus 13, 17 and 18 says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road to the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and go back to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Sometimes a shortcut will short circuit what God wants to do in your life. I mean, sure, they could have taken a more direct route, but they would have faced a fight they weren't ready for yet. They took a more difficult path because the easier path would have led to their destruction. Their time on the desert road taught them to survive in the wilderness, to fight, and to trust God to provide for them. They also received the Ten Commandments, which have proven to be fairly influential in the scope of world history. Sometimes the path isn't chosen for its efficiency, but for its potential to shape the people who travel there. The road they took might have been harder, 
But God was preparing his people to enter his promise. Unlike the people of Israel, you get to choose the road you're going to take. But Jesus wants to point out that these roads might not take you where you want to go. He said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. Most people are traveling on a road that won't take them where they want to go. The hard part about is that this road looks easy and inviting. It's a freshly paved highway, a well-worn, wide path. It looks like security in your job, the dream home, the perfect family, the perfect life. I mean, if it looked like it would lead to destruction, people wouldn't take that path. The road to life, on the other hand, looks much more difficult. It looks like sacrificing time and money and energy and efforts and wants and desires to follow someone who walked the earth over 2,000 years ago. It means willingly giving up the right to make the final decision about what you do with your life. No wonder not many choose this path. What you've got to decide is which path you're going to take. Because the path to the promise isn't easy. And it might not be pretty, but it will save you. Now, I don't know if you've noticed... But the pivotal points in your life are rarely pretty. It's the hard moments that shape us, isn't it? It's not the vacation that does it. It's the job loss, the death in the family, the global pandemic that shapes our lives. But I want to take this even one step further. Because in truth, it's not enough to decide which path you're going to take. You actually do have to enter through the gate and start walking the road. You see, many of us have intended to walk the path that leads to life, but, but never actually really gotten around to getting started. It's at this point that I'd like to share with you what Andy Stanley calls the principle of the path. Let this sink in deep. It's your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. It's your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. Intending to pay your light bill won't keep the power from getting shut off. Intending to call that person who just lost their spouse won't bring them comfort in their time of need. Intending to get off the couch won't cause you to lose weight. And intending to follow Jesus won't put you on the path to the promise either. Now Micah, he could want to go to the house more than anything in the world. But if we leave the church building and we head south, we aren't going to make it. Why? the wrong direction <laughs> pure intentions are good but they don't save you entering the gate and walking the path to life does so choose the harder way choose the road less traveled if you do i promise it will shape you i'm not the same person i was even five years ago when i came to swiss cove i thank god for that every day and i'm sure that you do too he's still working on me and i know he's still working on you why God is preparing his people to enter his promise. Yeah, we're members of the kingdom, but the promise, that's still to come. Even as you walk the narrow road, don't try to take the shortcuts that will short circuit what God wants to do in your life. And there are lots of shortcuts along the way. Let me show you something. It doesn't take much to understand that I could pay off my house more quickly if I stopped giving 10% of my income to the church. The road will be longer. If I keep giving, it's pretty easy to see. So why on earth would I do that? Let me ask you, why did God have Israel take the longer desert road? Because the shorter road would have led to their destruction. Did you know that Jesus talked about money more than heaven and hell combined? Why? Probably because it's his chief rival for my heart. The love of money is what? The root of all evil. It produces greed in my life, and that greed is destructive to my soul. Do you know how to fight greed? With generosity. I mean, God isn't asking you to give money because he's short on cash. He's asking you to give because he knows it will shape your heart to look more like his. He's preparing his people to enter his promise. But we want to take the shortcuts because shortcuts make it so much easier. So we'll tell a little white lie. You know, if it helps us get ahead or, you know, it just makes the day go a little more smoothly. Ever thought about that term, though? Little white lie? Is there such a thing? I mean, you do know who the father of lies is, right? There is nothing little about following the wrong path. But it's so much easier to hold that grudge than it is to let it go. 
Yet Jesus said, forgive, not just when it's easy, not just when they deserve it either. It's easy to react and blow up on somebody when they come at you. It's harder to take it, to turn the other cheek. It's easy to rant on social media about how your rights are being trampled on. It's harder to love your leaders, to pray for them, and to trust God even when you disagree. But what if, just go with me here, what if it turns out that God knows what he's doing as he leads you down the path that you're on right now? What if you aren't just supposed to get through the hard parts? What if you're supposed to grow through them? What if God really does work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Even viruses, even pandemics, even stay-at-home orders, even the diagnosis, even the boss that just won't do it the way you want it done, even your crazy family that you've been locked up with for a month, even, (laughs) even virtual learning for those kids. Am I in your life yet? Or do I need to keep going? God says, trust me. Follow me. I know where I'm going. Choose the harder way. Choose the road less traveled. It might not be the most popular route, but it's the only one that will take you where you want to go. Yeah, it's going to be harder. It's going to be longer. And it's going to change you. God is preparing you to enter his promise. Don't settle for a shortcut and miss the miracle that God wants to do in your life right now. If you need to enter the gate, now is your time. If you have never become a Christian, it's time to make that decision. We'll walk with you. And more importantly, Jesus will walk with you every step of the way. Reach out to us. We'd love to talk with you about what that looks like. It's time to enter the gate. If you've been a Christian for a while now, you've entered the gate, but you're not done. It's time to keep on the road. It's that road that leads to life. And sometimes it feels like a desert road, doesn't it? And just to be clear, just to be clear, I'm not saying that you're going to accidentally lose your salvation because you took a shortcut. You can't accidentally lose it. It's not like your keys. You can't set it down somewhere and forget it. The truth of the matter is, You can't even stay on this path to life on your own. I mean, you can try it. Maybe you've been trying it, and you're so frustrated that you're ready to give up. Don't give up. Jesus is the only one who's ever walked that path perfectly. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to chase after Jesus with everything we've got. We've got the Holy Spirit as our guide and the grace of God purchased by the blood of Jesus to cover our missteps along the path to life. We aren't worthy to enter the gate or walk the path. But praise be to Jesus, who is our gate, who opened the way so that we could choose to walk the path that leads to life. So even though we're going to fall and fail, we're going to keep going knowing that God is still working on us, still shaping us, and he still loves us even in the middle of our failures. So we're not going to give up. We're not going to settle for shortcuts. We're not going to try to grab the wheel. We're going to follow Jesus wherever he leads. The road will be longer, the path harder, but we know that the promise is at the end of this path. We know where this path leads. It leads to life. So we're going to make sure that we're on the right road, And we're going to help other people find it too. Because not everyone will just find it. But we know the way. Not everyone realizes that the path they're traveling on isn't going to lead them where they want to go. But we know where these roads lead. So God is asking us to enter that gate, to travel that road, and to bring as many people with us as we can. 